It's 8 o'clock. It's Health Watch Radio. I'm your host every week, Dr. Jacques Dweck. Tonight, we have our special guest, Dr. Rahmani. He's a gastroenterologist, and our topic of the night is IBS. And for those of you who don't know what IBS stands for, it stands for Irritable Bowel Syndrome, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. I want to just tell you a little bit about Dr. Rahmani. Dr. Rabin Rahmani, he's affiliated with Maimonides Medical Center, and his office that he works out of is located at 2211 Emmons Avenue in Brooklyn, and he does a lot of work with research and, of course, treating people with different gastro uh, disorders. So, for example, some of the things that he does is he does endoscopic ultrasound. He uses a video capsule. Now, I'd like to talk about that for a couple of minutes before we start talking about IBS, which is something very interesting. He uses a video capsule. It's sort of like something that I remember there was a movie, Fantastic Journey, or something like that, <laughs> where they had uh, some people that uh, they shrunk them down. They put them in this little capsule. They went inside the body. Mm -hmm. So here, it's, it's for real. So something very interesting. And also advanced therapeutic endoscopic procedures, all things that have to do with the whole digestive system. And he's done extensive research in different aspects of gastroenterology and hepatology, including colitis and, as we mentioned, irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, pancreatitis, and hepatitis. He's published over 60 different publications in different journals and is a regular contributor at national meetings and symposiums. We have a very special guest tonight. And also, in addition to that, we have a, a layperson with us, somebody who's going to share in my questions that we want to ask Dr. Rahmani in regards to IBS. So first, Dr. Rahmani, welcome tonight. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, Jack Cohen, welcome also. Good evening. A pleasure to be here, too. Okay. So, Dr. Rahmani, could you first define <coughs> with us what is irritable <coughs> bowel syndrome? It sounds like somebody's irritated, and it sounds <laughs> like their bowels get irritated. So, what's irritable bowel syndrome? That's, that's actually, believe it or not, a more complex question than uh, you would think. Uh, it's a little bit of a misnomer. Actually, it's one of the pet peeves in the GI community where, unfortunately, people get the uh, impression that it has something to do with the uh, personality profile of the patient, which is sometimes true. But I think one of the things that I'd like to talk about tonight, and one of the really interesting and fascinating things about irritable bowel syndrome that we're finding more and more, is that it's one of the most physiologically complicated and complex diseases, not just in the GI tract, but really in anything. And essentially what happens is, uh, with these patients, their bowel is a little bit more sensitive, sometimes a lot more sensitive than most people for different reasons that, that we'll get to. And they have a lot of different symptom manifestations that really affect their lives in a uh, variety of ways. So first thing is that their bowels are more sensitive. Right. And how is that going to play out for them? So one of the things that uh, everybody has to go through is the fact that the bowel is actually, you know, has more nerve endings by far than uh, the bra brain or the neurological uh, system does. And one of the things that's very important in regulating your body's metabolism is the nerve endings and the neurological uh, system, which the GI tract is very intricately in involved with. And uh, we're finding more and more that uh, one of the possibilities of things that may be going on with the patients with herbal bowel syndrome is that their nerve endings are supercharged, whereas other people uh, at different times they may have down-tuning or up-tuning of their nerve endings or the neurological symptoms. Uh, in patients with irritable bowel syndrome, it's kind of just a supercharged system that sometimes just keeps going and going and going, like the energizer bunny. And it could lead to a lot of different manifestations depending on how the dysregulation happens. It could lead sometimes to constipation, sometimes it could lead to diarrhea. Uh, very often it leads to discomfort in the abdomen, epigastric pain, crampiness, bloating, and usually all the above. And that's one of the things that that's really pretty frustrating. It's, it's all over the place. Absolutely. So, so somebody with irritable bowel syndrome, the nerve endings in their digestive tract, specifically in their large intestines, or it's 
Yeah, the large intestine is, is, is usually the main culprit. But again, one of the things that we're finding uh, more and more is there's a whole association between the large intestine, the small intestine, uh, the stomach, and even the esophagus, uh, whereby basically uh, just the uh, association of the different parts of the GI system don't necessarily function uh, and coordinate themselves the way they're supposed to. And sometimes that may lead to a lot of the manifestations, a lot of the symptoms that we have. The nerve ending uh, theory is one of the ones that uh, is very, very popular and there's a lot of evidence for it. There's other uh, theories and things that are, that are uh, being sought at scientifically and proven. One of the things that, that's very, very interesting is uh, we've known for a while that there was an association between allergies and irritable bowel syndrome. Mm. And uh, recently, one of the things that's, that's, that's noticeable is that the cells, which are really what's called mast cells, uh, these are the cells that are responsible for your allergic reaction or your immunologic reaction. Patients with irritable bowel syndrome have a larger uh, collection of mast cells in their GI tract. So one of the thoughts is that irritable bowel syndrome really may be a manifestation of some sort of an allergy, either to the environment, to food, to diet. Uh, and I think that's also something very, very, very exciting because in addition to explaining what the cause may be, going forward, it may be something that we could target therapeutically. Got it. So our first thing that we want to do is establish, and if you just joined us, again, it's Health Watch Radio. I'm your host every week, Dr. Jacques Dweck. Our guests tonight are Dr. Rabin Rahmani. He's a gastroenterologist. Our topic tonight is IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. And our second guest that's joining me with questions for Dr. Rahmani is Jack Cohen, and we hopefully we're going to get to the bottom of this problem because there are a lot of people who are suffering with irritable bowel syndrome, and we're defining this as, so far, people who have problems where they it manifest as could be diarrhea, could be constipation, could be bloating, could be abdominal pain, abdominal pain mm-hmm. and all of the above. Absolutely. So that's pretty frustrating for a lot of people. And imagine that, could you just give us a picture of somebody who has irritable bowel syndrome, what, what their day is like, what, what, why is it so, so much of a problem for them? So there's... Go ahead. Okay. Well, a day for me with irritable bowel syndrome, each day is different. You're always exploring. I'm always exploring what I could eat and what I can't eat. And I've been diagnosed about 15 years ago, so it's been a long journey. For example, I noticed for for a long time, every Wednesday, I think my wife makes eggs. Mm -hmm. And every Wednesday, I would have an IBS attack pretty much soon after I ate that. And And I thought... For years that it was the eggs, it was maybe the toast, I started to realize along the other foods that I eat that certain oils give me right away diarrhea and abdominal cramps like canola oil and like um, olive oil. So one day I found out that my wife was spraying the pan with (laughs) Pam, with Pam. And Pam has canola oil. And I said, Marlene, we, we have to switch because I think canola oil is my enemy. <laughs> so, so, so immediately she switched to vegetable oil because she knew olive oil was not good for me. And I'm fine now with my Wednesday egg that's day. That's crazy. What do you say about that, Dr. Rahmani? I think that's actually a very typical story. And it brings out a very good point. I actually just had a patient today uh, who I had other issues, other GI issues, which I had dealt with in the past. Uh, with different types of, you know, infections and colitis and things like that. But her main issue right now is really her irritable bowel syndrome. And, you know, we've tried a lot of different things. And at this point, one of the best things uh, I find, you know, both based on on research experience and clinical experience, is something uh, which is really essentially just trial and error, where patients, and I think this goes, you know, along the theory of, the mast cells or the allergies being responsible somewhat for uh, irritable bowel syndrome, where patients uh, keep a very careful food diary, and they essentially do what's called an elimination diet, where one by one, they try to eliminate certain things that they have very frequently in their diet, and they could kind of keep tabs uh, and see when they start to have improvement of symptoms. 
Now the tricky thing about it is like what you were saying is sometimes people don't even think about the uh, kind of hidden ingredients the food that may really be the triggers. Yeah, the food preparations are just sometimes something that we have no idea. Absolutely. And it's a very common thing we see uh, really in a lot of different GI things. I mean, in, in celiac disease, which is somewhat r- you know, related to irritable bowel syndrome, where it's essentially an allergy to uh, protein in wheat, it's, again, a very similar thing where people are just not aware of the different ingredients that are being put into their food. I'll give you another example, uh, a favorite restaurant of mine, of mine that I won't mention on the air. <laughs> Uh, I love going there, and my family knows that, and I always eat meat, and meat really shouldn't bother me at all. One day I had a theory. I went over to the owner of the restaurant. I says, you're probably basting the meat with olive oil. He says, of course. All of our meat are chicken. How could you do it without olive oil? And later on I was able to order those those meats every time without olive oil. I found out olive oil was not my friend. <laughs> so <clears throat> besides the, the meals... I know that, that I've heard from different people with irritable bowel syndrome that one of the problems that they had is driving, going on long journeys. Uh, I had the problem yesterday. Yesterday, I, I, I went to someone's house, and we had a great time, a great barbecue, but I had forgotten to warn the person who was doing the barbecuing that I can't. What's the chances you would think somebody would spray Pam on the meat? So... I found out that the, this person was spraying the Pam on the meat, and I just finished telling you what Pam does to me. And I had to go in a car, but I, I was never able, it, right from the table, I was in their bathroom for, for the next hour. I was embarrassed to tell, there's a lot of embarrassment that goes with this. You never want to really tell somebody, I got to go to the bathroom, and I have to go to the bathroom, and, and, and I just came out, and I, I got to go back into the bathroom. And then I, I got to make Those it. are the stories that I've heard about the irritable bowel syndrome, that that frustration of having to be in and out of the bathroom or being on a long trip, and then here it is, they're stuck in traffic. And it happened last night. I, 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 I went from, from Deal, New Jersey to Brooklyn, and uh, the last half hour was miserable, holding my muscles and making sure that I don't have an accident in the car, and then I have to tell my wife, listen, i got to drop myself off, and you got to drop whoever off, else off because I need to, and she already knows the story. When she sees me running with her, when I'm walking on the streets, I just suddenly start the race in front of her and my children. They know I'm running to the bathroom. So, Dr. Rahmani, now we painted a picture, uh, a pretty frustrating picture for people with irritable bowel syndrome of what it's like with their meals, what it's like with traveling, and the embarrassment that they go through of having to be in and out of the bathroom. What immediate things can they do? You're saying one of the things to do is to try and figure out what's bringing it on. And that uh, the diet diary of what they're eating and try and carefully document everything. And like we said, sometimes they're hidden things, but carefully documenting what they're eating and then one by one trying to eliminate certain frequent things. So that's great. But now what happens at the beginning of the exploratory journey, let's call it? Sure. I think, you know, there's really two sides uh, to the point. You know, in, in uh, one respect, it's really a very debilitating condition like you were talking about. I mean, I have patients that, uh, for lack of a choice, I had to enroll in trials because... It was literally taking away their lives. I mean, I have a patient who is 60 who has really lost the majority of his life because of the uh, debilitation that's associated with this condition. And, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the treatment, but I think I want to focus also on the other side uh, of the coin is the fact that I find a lot of times in the community, unfortunately, what happens is uh, patients that may have other GI diseases uh, don't necessarily get the workup that they should be getting. And sometimes a lot of things that are not irritable bowel syndrome just get labeled either by their primary care doctors or by their uh, even specialists as irritable bowel syndrome. I'll give you a, an excellent example. I had a uh, middle-aged lady who saw me in the hospital about a year and a half ago. The lady was a very nice lady. She was really uh, suffering for a long time from terrible, terrible pains. And you know, she had had some basic workup, upper endoscopy, colonoscopy, uh, you know, some CAT scans, or things of that nature. And once those tests were negative, she was just labeled as irritable bowel syndrome. And it's one of those labels that really travels with you. I'm sure you probably find this is anytime you go in, you know, uh, and you have an abdominal uh, symptom, they say, oh, he's, he has irritable bowel syndrome. And it kind of just gets thrown to the wayside. And 
with this patient, I felt that you know it really didn't make sense. All the symptoms couldn't be, couldn't be attributed to that. And after doing a little bit of a workup, I was able to figure out that she had what's called sphincter of Odi dysfunction. Now, the sphincter of Odi is a muscle in the uh, GI tract connected to the uh, gallbladder and the biliary tree that kind of regulates how much bile is secreted in order for your food to be digested. Okay, wait, has- so let, let's slow down for our, our listeners because one of the things that happens very often is that you and I are very familiar with some of the language sure. and our listeners are not. So a sphincter is like a valve that opens and closes. So there's a valve that's connected with the the tubing, the tubing that, that that's goes connected to your liver, your your gallbladder, and your pancreas, that is uh, responsible for secreting bile, which is in turn responsible for the digestion of your food. Now, sometimes what happens is this muscle is is very very strong, and instead of opening and closing properly, it just remains shut. And when that happens, it can be very painful. It can cause a lot of symptoms that are comparable and similar to irritable bowel syndrome. There's a somewhat easy method to fixing this, which is an advanced procedure that, that, that we sometimes do, where we go in endoscopically and we cut the muscle, which is what I did with that lady. And she was better. She was cured. So but, here but was a well, case. All along, she was being told, you have irritable bowel syndrome, exactly. and she really didn't. So, exactly. So this is a critical point, and that is that people are getting labeled sure. with this very... A uh, big bucket called irritable bowel syndrome that a lot of things seem to fall into that bucket but meanwhile they could have other things and not get them diagnosed and be suffering for a long time unnecessarily absolutely and really you know it is a very common uh, uh, symptom very common syndrome you know some of the latest uh, uh, data show that as much as 20 percent of Americans actually suffer, suffer from uh, irritable bowel syndrome if they would seek the attention uh, that, that they require. A lot of times they don't. They just assume it's normal and they go on with it. But well, well, when you're saying that they suffer and they don't seek attention, so let's say we take the, the example of a certain type of a food and let's say canola oil was that food. A certain type of a food that is the trigger. Mm-hmm. So if a person knows that whenever they have canola oil that this is what happens to them, so they avoid canola oil, so could they go through their life and not have irritable bowel syndrome? I'd like to answer that. Go ahead. I think that uh, the, the the food elimination and 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 oh, you've ch- done that that hundred percent and writing it down and uh, and I want to tell you that it changes. I th- there's been times when I've been very sensitive to dairy product and I was told that I was lactose intolerance. I was told that I was uh, that the dairy is a big trigger and some some fancy doctor in Manhattan checked the different parameters of what I eat and he said I'm I'm off the charts for milk products. However, after not touching milk products for maybe six months, I was able to bring it back into my diet to a limited degree. Interesting. I want to segue into something for a second that, that maybe you, might, you, you wouldn't ask me. I re- remember the day when I got my first IBS attack only 15 years ago, and, I, and, and maybe this could be even a warning for other people. I was diagnosed with an ulcer. I was given a regimen of antibiotics, I forgot which ones, I mean, the doctor, you might know which one. It's a three, four-day thing, something really strong. It didn't work, according to the doctor, and he made me take that regimen again. He never told me later, I found out, I should have been taking a lactobacillus or some kind of a good uh, uh, Probiotic. uh, probiotics. And and I, I didn't take and that. we definitely want to talk about the probiotics because Dr. Rahmani has done a lot of research and written extensively on probiotics so, so, so you I brought up a good point jack i didn't take that and lo and behold within a couple of weeks was my first ibs attack i never had it before and it was the strangest thing it was like you said you know you just you're tra- i was traveling a long distance i was going with my good friend to baltimore and it was an emergency from gas station to gas station to the restroom to the restroom and ever since then it's been this journey again so, what you describe is actually pretty typical you know what we think actually happens is that there is an underlying predisposition that a lot of people have to irritable bowel syndrome. And a lot of times people have it just lie dormant for a long time. And then there's a trigger. The question is what the trigger is. Sometimes it could be stress. Sometimes it could be a change in the diet or in the environment. A lot of times you find this in people that go traveling for the first time or for an extensive, extensive period of time. And sometimes it could actually be an infection. Uh, there, there's an uh, entity called post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome, mm-hmm. where essentially what happens is the bacteria... Uh, from the infection, change 
the what's called flora. Flora is a normal, quote-unquote, good bacteria that we all have in our gut, in our ecosystem. And by doing that, this could serve as the trigger point, as the start uh, of really irritable bowel syndrome. And a lot of times what happens, unfortunately, is that once you're over that edge, a lot of times there's no going back. There is help, you know, there is light at the end of the tunnel, but again, you have to be aware of your symptoms and you have to seek the right help. So m my question right now is, is there something that people who don't have irritable bowel syndrome right now should be doing preventively to avoid getting irritable bowel syndrome? The people who have it will hopefully try to give them some guidelines of what to do. But the people who don't have irritable bowel syndrome right now, it, are there things that should, like for example, we're talking about probiotics. Is probiotics something that is preventive of irritable bowel syndrome? Probiotics definitely could help. Uh, you know, there is some data that, that it could uh, aid at least, I would say, or, or, or be helpful in the prevention of irritable bowel syndrome or at least controlling some of the, uh, the symptoms. Other things really are, again, diet and healthy exercise regimen and lifestyle. Uh, there's a lot so of all the things that make you healthy in your heart and make you healthy in, in so many ways are going to also be a good preventive for irritable bowel syndrome. Absolutely, absolutely. And, uh, you know, it used to be, be anecdotal, but again, there's more and more evidence mounting that those things really change your body, not just uh, in a kind of theoretical uh, point of view, but also in a real way. They, you know, rewire the nerve endings. They, they uh, change the motility of your bowel. A lot of things that may contribute to the symptoms that patients with irritable bowel syndrome have. Right, so somebody who's more sedentary, they're not active. A person who's not active, what happens to their bowels is their bowels have a greater chance of being more irritable? Right. Well, what, what could happen is the motility could be affected. Uh, somebody who's sedentary could have uh, a dysregulation of the, uh, of the motility so that instead of uh, the bowel being able to absorb water and being able to aid in the digestion in the proper way, uh, it could kind of just be very, very delayed. And when that happens, again, you allow an environment where different bacteria that are not supposed to really be sitting there in the bowel could take over and, and contribute a lot to these, to these symptoms. And also just, uh, you know, things such as distension uh, and uh, lack of motility or over-motility could all really contribute to having those symptoms. So again, if you just joined us, it's Health Watch Radio. I'm your host every week, Dr. Jacques Dweck. Our special guest tonight, uh, Dr. Rabin Rahmani. He's a gastroenterologist. Our topic tonight is irritable bowel syndrome. And also our guest is Dr. Uh, well, he's not a doctor, but he feels like a doctor. Uh, Jack Cohen, a good friend of mine. And we're talking about what we can do right now to prevent irritable bowel syndrome. So if we wanted to make a little list, what would be on that little list of things to do to prevent irritable bowel syndrome? Would on that list be having probiotics as a preventive measure? Probiotics are interesting, you know, just again, to go back and explain a little bit about what probiotics are. Uh, everybody, all of us, uh, have in our, what's called ecosystem, really in our, in our gut, in our body, tens of thousands of different uh, bacteria. Now, normally when we think about bacteria, we think about germs, we think about things that could hurt us. It turns out that that's not always the case. There are such good things as, such things as, as, as good bacteria, and Essentially what they do is they allow the food to be properly digested. They allow the food uh, to be properly absorbed into your body. And what sometimes happens, again, this could be secondary to an infection. It could even be a small case of food poisoning. Is those things, those bacteria, that flora could start to get dysregulated. What probiotics does uh, is it repopulates the gut, the GI tract, with bacteria that have been found to be not toxic, uh, and essentially those quote-unquote good bacteria are not compete for nutrients and for, uh, you know, other types of uh, uh, the goodies that we have in our microenvironment with the bad bacteria. And over time, they're able to take over and repopulate your gut, your GI tract, uh, hopefully the proper way, and allow your system to uh, kind of reorient itself and go back to the way that it was supposed to be. And there's been a lot of data now, uh, because again, you know, going along with the trend of, uh, you know, alternative medicine, if you will, and uh, 
uh, you know, vitamins and yoga and, and that, going, that, that whole kind of uh, school of thought of probiotics being high reward, low risk uh, medicines that we could take. And uh, there is a lot of data out there to support that when it comes to herbal bowel syndrome, when it comes to other things such as possibly liver diseases, uh, such as infections in the bowel. One of the uh, studies that uh, we had done in Maimonides that got a lot of attention last year was in regard to probiotics in the setting of patients that had something called C. difficile colitis, which is a very common infection uh, which elderly people and people that have been on antibiotics could get. And, and more and more we are finding that the system uh, really needs this good bacteria, that probiotics works and that it's, it's worthwhile uh, to to use it in, in, in a lot of situations. Now, I wouldn't recommend it for everybody. I don't think this is so something that... So that's my real question. Yeah. Is, it, is it something that is a good preventive thing? Like, you know, people want to take something that's, you know, I want to do something preventively. So you're saying, before you take probiotics, what should you do? How do you know that you need it or you don't need it? I think, again, I think a patient-doctor relationship is extremely important. I don't think it's something that every person uh, necessarily needs to be on. If somebody has a tendency or maybe has a family history of uh, herbal bowel syndrome or GI, GI problems, or somebody was recently on antibiotics, then I think in those cases maybe maybe worthwhile. If somebody has uh, you know, elderly relatives that have been on antibiotics or have been hospitalized recently, I think in those cases it might be worthwhile to consider. Uh, somebody again, told me somebody told me one of the doctors that I was interviewing told me something interesting. He said, if you're gonna give somebody probiotics because I will often put people on antibiotics for dental infections. So he says, uh, he says, yeah, it's a good idea to put them also on probiotics. Just make sure that they're not taking the probiotics at the same time as they're <laughs> taking the antibiotics because all they're going to do is kill the bacteria with the antibiotics that they're taking. Right, that's actually that's so, a good point. Right, so but when do you take it then? So in other words, if I, take, if I put somebody on uh, twice a day antibiotic every 12 hours, so what? Uh, six hours later, I should put them on the probiotics? Yeah, or you could even take it once a day. I mean, a lot of times what I do is I just have them take it with breakfast. Uh, and I just, you know, separate it by, by about an hour or two if they're going to take antibiotics at the same time. And by the way, it doesn't have to be necessarily pills. Uh, people don't know this. There's a lot of dietary things like that yogurt, was, that's what I want sauerkraut. To ask. That's my question. Those things actually have natural probiotics that are infused in them. So a lot of times what I recommend the patients that have as that patients on antibiotics, I'll tell them to make sure to have one or two yogurts a day at least for the duration of the time that they're taking the antibiotics, and I find that very helpful. Well, for me, a problem is that uh, I could take the yogurt, but then the yogurt creates IBS. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that could be a problem. So, so that's a problem. But I was going to ask you, doctor, what other foods could you recommend if I don't want to take a, a probiotic? You get a, a hot dog with sauerkraut now, and you're all set. Just throw out the hot dog. You know, sauerkraut <laughs> is, a, is, is a musical food. <laughs> so, One of the things that I think is very, very helpful is, is you know, high-fiber diets. I always tell my patients, if you're going to have wheat, uh, it's better to have whole wheat than to have uh, what I call empty wheat, which is really just, you know, white, white flour. Uh, I think that's, that's very important. Uh, high-fiber supplements a lot of times are essential because even though you may think that uh, you have enough fiber in your, in your diet, it's very rare that people actually do have enough, you know. Uh, You're talking in, about in like Metamucil, American, like Metamucil, what type of... A there's different formulations. There's Metamucil, there's Benefiber, there's Fibercon. And honestly, when it comes to probiotics and fiber, they're all the same. Uh, you know, really? Whether, yeah. Somebody told me, I'm telling you, I, I've heard a lot of somebody told me, but somebody told me, one of the doctors said that it makes a difference when you, let's say pills, right? Mm -hmm. It says there's certain probiotics that they keep refrigerated for a reason because if you don't, then you're just feeding dead bacteria. I mean, that's possible when it comes to, you know, some of them, maybe some of the different formulations need to be refrigerated. But when it comes to the efficacy, and this is one of the things that we found in our study, specifically with C. colitis, which was that infection that I was talking about before, is that the type of antibiotic really does not make a big difference. The, the, the type of probiotic really does not make a difference. It's the fact that you are on some sort of probiotic. Now, I will tell the listeners that there's a large market out there right now for this, and there's a lot of fake, quote-unquote, probiotics. So it's important to be getting uh, your medicine, like anything else, from a legitimate drugstore, a legitimate health food store, where you actually trust the person, or, again... You know, it's very important to have a, a, a doctor, a physician, whether it's a primary care doctor, a nutritionist, or a gastroenterologist that you could have these discussions with to make sure that you're actually taking the appropriate medication. Right. 
I wanted to mention um, a little bit about when I wake up in the morning, what I eat, and I th and I found this is very preventive, and probably you'll agree it's a high fiber uh, diet. Maybe four or five times a week, my wife makes me fresh oatmeal, boiled, and she takes an apple, boils it, and mashes it into the oatmeal. And I pretty much have that almost every day, and I really have no issues at all. And also, I mentioned to you off the air that I I have. Uh, um, reflux and, and other kinds of stomach issues. So this is like a magical food. Hot oatmeal, fresh oatmeal with a, with a boiled apple mashed into it. You could throw some cinnamon on it. I even sometimes throw walnuts and raisins and Molly gets to make me this almost every day. Hmm. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> yeah, be careful. I mean, it's, you know, again, these are very individualized uh, types of regimens, but there's a lot of people out there that have nut allergies. Uh, so you know, again, you want to be careful that, you know, you're not helping yourself at the same time that you're, you're shooting yourself in the foot. So you have to really kind of reach that balance where uh, you're getting rid of things that your body doesn't agree with and introducing things that, that your body uh, is able to digest properly. So let's just try and review a little bit. Somebody who has irritable bowel syndrome, they could have some of the following symptoms. Uh, diarrhea, constipation, bloating, stomach pain. Yep, and all absolutely. of the above probably. Absolutely. Right? And their life experience could be that they find themselves being forced to go to the bathroom at very embarrassing and inconvenient times such as on a long trip. And when they find that they're eating certain types of foods, it may be a trigger. Now that we know the background, that's a, I'll call that the background, now the person can try and figure out what it is that could be a trigger and certainly yeah. they're doing this under the care of a, of a physician because to try and make your own diagnosis doesn't make a lot of sense, especially when you're dealing with something like this because as Dr. Rahmani mentioned, it could be very well that you don't really even have irritable bowel syndrome. You could have something totally different right. and it seems to have some of the symptoms that irritable bowel syndrome has and instead of getting the right treatment because you went to the to the health food store and decided that you're going to buy some probiotics and uh, uh, some anti-irritable bowel uh, magic uh, formula that they have there. And really, you should have been at the medical doctor and finding out what exactly your diagnosis is. So th I think that's very important. Uh, finding out through your doctor and, f and following that path. What is the hope for people with IBS? That's my question to Dr. Rahmani. What is the hope for them? So... I would say like this, there's no cure for IBS, but uh, as, at least as of yet, but it is becoming more and more controllable. Uh, and again, you know, the things that I was talking about before, such as the uh, propensity of the mast cells, the fact that we're finding that this may be related to some sort of food allergy process. Uh, what that allows us to do is to target uh, a uh, certain type of uh, mast cell stabilizers, things that could stop these mast cells from uh, degranulating, meaning getting getting their uh, uh, their products out there and causing a lot of the symptoms that that we see with with people with irritable bowel syndrome. This has been done for years for patients with other allergies, asthma, bronchitis, things like that. And one of the hopes is that as we find more and more about the pathophysiology, about the underlying reason, the mechanism of irritable bowel syndrome, we go ahead and have targeted therapy such as that. Another Are example, you doing that now? In other words, do you find that, that that's one of your tools that you're using to treat irritable bowel syndrome I do. now? I actually, I personally do, and I have some success with it. Uh, there are studies going on that, that show some, some uh, uh, efficacy with that. And again, I think over the course of the next few years, we're going to find more and more such trials. One of the things that's a little bit challenging with irritable bowel syndrome is normally what we do in the uh, research community for something to really show efficacy is we do what's called a double-blind randomized controlled trial, which means we take two patients that are similar as far as their disease entity is concerned. We give one of them sugar pills or placebo, and we give the other patient the medicine that we're trying to test out to see if it works. And obviously by going and following those patients over time, you could see if there's a difference, if the medicine actually works, as opposed to the sugar pill. What's very interesting with irritable bowel syndrome is that there's a very high placebo effect. So, uh, 
if you look at the research trials, almost 30%, a third of the, of the patients in the control arm, the people that are taking the sugar pills, when you give them uh, surveys, will tell you that they're doing much better. They feel much better. So, doctor, maybe I should start taking sugar pills. That's not a bad idea. It's much cheaper. <laughs> so, you know, the challenge is to try to go from that 30% to 60%, 70%. That makes therapy a little bit more, more, more difficult. Whereas, you know, if you have a disease entity where the placebo effect is only 5%, so if you get them to uh, have a medication that has a 20% effect, you're making a huge breakthrough. So I think that's one of the challenges with, with irritable bowel syndrome. The question is, why is that? Why is there such a high placebo effect? Again, let's just uh, tell people, r remind people, what is a placebo effect? It's when you take something that's not real, Correct. and you think that it's real because you're in the study, so you don't know if you had the real pill or you had not the real pill. You're taking something that's not real, and you think, unfortunately for these people, maybe it's fortunate, you feel better. Right. Right. And again, you know, that, that makes it uh, somewhat challenging. Another thing that's, be that's being uh, studied is there's a lot of, uh, chemical neurotransmitters. These are different molecules, uh, proteins and such that we have in the body that regulate the nerves, really regulate everything in our body. One of the things is serotonin. Serotonin is one of the things, one of the uh, substances that's secreted in our body. And this regulation of serotonin is uh, very commonly found in patients that have, that have irritable bowel syndrome. So one of the things that we're looking at right now is whether by giving what's called serotonin inhibitors, for example, in patients that are screening too much serotonin, you could go ahead and uh, somehow modify those effects and therefore the symptoms that those patients are getting from the serotonin. So again, whereas probably 10, 15 years ago, people that had irritable bowel syndrome were just labeled as being quote unquote irritable and a lot of times unfortunately irritating or just, you know, we're thought to have, uh, you know, issues with anxiety or, or, or such. We're finding more and more that there's real physical things that are going on. And the question now has become how to target those things in order to make the patients feel better. Fantastic. All right. So if you are joining us now, you're too late because the show is just about over. I, I wanted to thank Dr. Rahmani, Dr. Rabin Rahmani for joining us. He's a uh, head of Maimonides Medical uh, Research Division of Gastroenterology and Medical Education, and he is available, if you want to reach him, at 718-368-2960, and it's on 2211 Emmons Avenue in Brooklyn, and he has office hours, and you could make an appointment and really find out if you do have issues Make sure that uh, you have the right issues. And I wanted to thank also Jack Cohen for joining us and sharing with us some personal things that could hopefully help other people who, you know, these are the type of topics that people don't talk about. And unfortunately, by not talking about them, they're not getting help for them. And by hearing the, about them tonight on the show, hopefully if you or somebody that you care about has an issue that sounds like it's irritable bowel syndrome, it makes a lot of sense to get into your physician, either your primary care physician or your uh, gastroenterologist. And like I said, Dr. Uh, Rahmani is available at 368-2960 and make an appointment, sit down, talk about what you have, and try and figure out what it is that you do have. If it's irritable bowel syndrome, now it seems that there are new ways that we can try and figure out how to help that person. And if it's not irritable bowel syndrome, like that lady who had the problem with the sphincter with that little valve on her uh, uh, bile gland, well, what her life changed just by doing a small little minor operation to cut that little muscle, and she feels so much better now, and they were labeling her irritable bowel syndrome for years. So all our listeners, hopefully you grew a lot from tonight's discussion, and I uh, look forward to, seeing, to having you on the show Every week, listen to us here on Health Watch Radio, Monday nights at 8 o'clock. And again, I thank Dr. Rahmani. Thank I thank Jack Cohen. Thank you. And uh, I thank all you listeners for listening.